Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to this talk. I think I've been um, really subtle with the title of this talk. I don't really want to overpromise too much. <laughs> so uh, we'll have to see where this goes. Uh, my name is Rob Clark. I work for uh, HB Helion Security, and I've been doing that for a number of years. Uh, so this talk is going to be somewhat of a whistle-stop whistle tour of security technologies that are available in Linux and in OpenStack. Uh, different ways to enhance security and to help contain threats. And hopefully, in applying these technologies, you won't completely break your cloud for your customers. So who here is involved in uh, running a cloud for some like internal or external customers? Awesome. OK. So all of this should be uh, well known to you, and I'm sure you're all doing everything perfectly well. So why am I here talking, you, talking to you today? Uh, I'm the lead security architect for HP Helion, and I've been working on cloud security technologies for a number of years now. Um, much of my focus, at least for the last three years, has been OpenStack. Uh, I've been very involved in trying to push security solutions uh, into upstream. So trying to uh, work with uh, starting up the vulnerability management team, which handles security advisories. I'll mention those a little bit more as we go on. Um, I co-founded the OpenStack Security Group, uh, which exists to provide you with a number of different security functions. Um, we've managed to grow from the two of us back in the Folsom time frame to, uh, I think, 256 people, something like that, with probably 30 or 40 active contributors. And for those of you that are involved in other OpenStack projects, you know that actually having sort of 30 or 40 active contributors is, is pretty good. Um, and yeah, to my eternal fame, I'm one of the co-authors on the security guide. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the security project. So the OpenStack Security Group recently incorporated the vulnerability management team and applied to become an official project under OpenStack. And I, I'm glad to be able to tell you that we were actually accepted a few weeks ago. So the security project is now a horizontal team within OpenStack, much in the same way that the documentation team is. Um, we're responsible for, for providing a number of different services to OpenStack. Um, so the vulnerability management team remains largely autonomous within the group. Uh, they're there to deal with the really nasty things that come in, and they have to uh, respond to quickly, and they have to respond to them confidentially. Um, they will issue OpenStack security advisories. We issue things called OpenStack security notes. So these are either the can't, fi can't fix, won't fix that come in through the vulnerability management team, uh, they deal more with design issues that will have lasting effects and also deal with third-party vulnerabilities and, and third-party issues. Um, we work on the security guide. The security guide, I'll, I'll mention a little bit more in a moment. Uh, threat analysis for various projects within OpenStack. Um, at the moment, that's something we're, we're going to have to focus a little bit more on. We have some published threat analysis out for Keystone. Uh, a new thing we're doing at the moment is developer guidance. So on, uh, actually on security.openstack.org, we have a bunch of developer guidance that we've written to allow developers uh, easier access to OpenStack-centric security guidance. So things we've seen developers do wrong in the past. Um, we also have tooling projects. So Anchor and Bandit are these two tooling projects we have at the moment. Um, Anchor is an ephemeral PKI system that I'll, I'll, I'll speak to a little bit more as the talk goes on. And Bandit is a Python security linter for finding vulnerabilities in, in Python code. And that's actually integrated into the, the gates of a number of projects um, for detecting and giving early feedback on vulnerabilities that might otherwise go out into OpenStack. So security guide, uh, I'm mentioning this because all of you that are working on OpenStack clouds and providing customers with services should at least have the PDF copy of this. It is available in tree form, although in fairness, that, uh, is a little bit out of date now, but that's going to change during the delivery cycle. Um, it has lots of information around isolating security domains, best practices, hypervisor selection, that sort of thing. And it's, uh, it's a good starting point for a lot of the things I'm going to discuss today. So originally, I was going to spend a lot of time on this talk going through the different ways that you can secure different OpenStack services. Um, the idea is we're going to walk through, to a certain extent, stages of, of consideration. So before you install your cloud, how to know who to trust. 
um, when you're doing the installation, things to consider, and then post-installation, how do you mature your solution? And we're going to run through kind of a kind of a, a, a menu, really, of things. We're not going to be able to go into too much depth on any single one of them, but the idea is that uh, you're all smart people. If I make something, make you aware of something you weren't aware of before, you can go away and work out how best to apply it yourself. So that was the plan. And then, uh, is anybody aware of a big vulnerability in virtualization technology recently? No? Yeah? OK. Uh, so I got a lot of feedback, and some questions started coming in um, regarding this little guy. Uh, so the Venom vulnerability landed, and it was quickly apparent from a number of the private messages I got from people working at other cloud organizations that this was causing some pretty serious concerns. So what I've actually done is spent a whole bunch of time talking uh, not necessarily about VM escapes, uh, but um, talking about the different containment and isolation technologies that exist today that would allow you to deal with issues like Venom in, um, in ways that mean that you can, you can compensate for malicious actors without having to basically unplug your cloud. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to talk about both of these things and uh, just try and squeeze it all in the time that we have available. So this is probably a triangle that's familiar to a number of you in the room. It's a fairly standard way of describing threat actors. Um, at the top, we have intelligence services. There used to be a little F in front of that, but now we don't have the F in front of it. Oh, sorry, F is uh, foreign intelligence services. So, uh, <laughs> so we, we've got rid of that now. Um, serious organized crime below that. So those are the, you know, we're talking really about Russian underground, that sort of thing. Um, highly capable in, uh, groups are people like anonymous, um, motivated, motivated individuals, and then script kiddies. And so the, the complexity and likelihood of exploitation tends to go up. Um, there aren't many organizations that could uh, stand up and tell you that they'd be resilient against any attack from an intelligence service. Um, but we'd like to think that we might be able to protect against most things from script kiddies. So you kind of draw a sort of wavy line here in terms of what you're expecting to protect against. And I think that's, that's something that probably rings true for most people in this room. And the reason you draw the wavy line there is because the cost of the controls that you have to apply to protect against anything above that level become incredibly expensive and will probably break your business. So we start off at the bottom, uh, understanding who's going to be interacting with your hardware, with your hardware and uh, do you need to trust it. Are there supply chain issues, which, means you, which mean you want to place special things on, on the provider of your hardware? Um, how are you going to handle technicians and admins in your data centers? Are your data centers yours alone? Are they shared colos, if they're colos? What's the physical security like? Um, I once did a review of a data, data center somewhere where someone explained that they, it was a colo, but it was in a cage and they had locks. But they couldn't tell me when the locks were changed or who had the cages before they moved in. So things like that you need to be aware of. And for a lot of physical access things, there are uh, well understood compensating controls. So established staff or systems that require multiple staff members to be involved, um, vetting background checks. Uh, also men with guns. I find men, men with guns are pretty good um, compensating controls to avoid uh, intentional intrusion into data centers. Um, but this is a technical talk. So, uh, so what we've got up here is a, a picture of a, a a TPM. Does everyone know what a TPM device is? Trusted platform stuff? Um, OK, so there was an excellent talk by Matthew Garrett a couple of days ago at this conference going into a lot more depth than I will about the TPM. But it provides you with a number of functions. It allows you to uh, attest to the state of different things on a system as it boots up. And it provides, uh, amongst other things, a way for you to verify that your BIOS hasn't been modified, that uh, changes aren't happening on, um, with PCIe devices. Uh, one of the limits of the technology today, uh, the point down at the bottom there, uh, attestation is really only at instantiation. So uh, it allows you to check that a hypervisor has come up in a known good state. But there's limited value to you knowing that three months ago your hypervisor was in a known good state, especially when you have things like, like, uh, like Venom. So uh, there are, this is where the costs of controls come in. So you, you can have. A, a, an infrastructure where you're doing cascading migrations that allow you to restart hypervisors every day, and then you only have a window of exploitation of a day where you can't attest to knowing the state of a machine. 
um, I know of at one cloud technology that, that had a system like this. Um, unfortunately, they all now work for Oracle. Um, so network boundaries. Uh, this is straight out of the security guide. Uh, the security guide recommends that you should have at least these four networks. And actually, I think you should have more. But the diagram was already in the security guide, so <laughs> I just use this one. Um, so public is you know, your internet, your untrusted networks. Your guest network, depending on your deployment, you probably don't want to trust the guest network. Uh, there are some situations where you might, but what we see is people use, want to use the cloud to replace everything. They, you know, you're going to have everything from your external facing marketing pages to uh, internal super secret source running on the same cloud, different tenants, but running on the same cloud. And you should kind of aggregate trust downwards in, in that regard so you don't, you don't trust uh, that network at all. Um, management, again, my preference would be to divide this up. Uh, in, in the security guide, it refers to both, uh, let's say, uh, cloud management traffic, like uh, your RabbitMQ uh, stuff might be going on there, uh, but also um, provisioning and config management might be traveling over that network as well. So either way, it's very sensitive. Uh, I'd recommend breaking up a little bit. And then your data network. This, uh, again, is very sensitive, but uh, tends to be more isolated because you, you're mainly talking about your storage backplane for, for Swift or that sort of stuff. So working out which networks to trust can be a challenge. Um, again, part of it comes down to understand, understanding who has access to your networks. Um, how do you know if somebody plugs into a switch in your data center? Or for that matter, if something just gets cross-wired? And all of a sudden, your very trusted network is just bridged onto um, your untrusted network. So understanding those sort of things is important. Understanding how your, your network layout, at layout logically works is important. There are options for securing some of this stuff. Um, cryptographic overlays is something we start to see a little bit more of at the moment. I've spoken to a couple of people over the last few days about layering IPsec for these different networks so that if you accidentally plug the wrong thing in, or if some bad person plugs the wrong thing in, they, they should just get gibberish. Um, the various options, the various problems with X5, um, IPsec and shared secrets and things notwithstanding. Uh, so bridging networks is an important point to bring up. And there's actually some really interesting stuff we can do nowadays that we couldn't do a few years ago to, to help keep things separate. So, it's very nice to be able to draw these separate networks, but unfortunately, especially with OpenStack, almost everything has to talk to almost everything else, which means each one of these individual nodes is connected to a large number of these different networks, um, which causes problems. In, in this example, uh, the data network and management network are, are bridged by a compute host. But actually, it's very likely the compute host would bridge all three. Um, so you have something that's largely entrusted because it's sitting, talking to the public internet, or also having the capacity to talk to your private and uh, very trusted networks. So you need to deal with that. And there are interesting ways to do it now that we couldn't do before. Uh, so one of the big problems uh, that we had in terms of isolation and containing things, especially with OpenStack, was that um, a lot of the controls that are available to you, you can only really apply to a, a given binary, a given process. Um, and that can be challenging when your entire stack is written in Python because Python is an interpreter and I can't put a whole bunch of rules just on the scripts and enforce that the interpreter will use a certain script, um, at least not in a robust way that we found particularly useful. Uh, but technologies like uh, containers and, and even virtual env now give you the opportunity to have individual interpreters for individual tasks. So you can have a Python interpreter for doing Nova stuff and a Python interpreter for doing let's say Neutron, but it allows you to keep them separate and apply different sets of controls to each interpreter. But as we all know, and, and as a product manager at a certain organization that I won't mention told me the other day, security is easy. You turn on the firewall, you enable antivirus, and turn on updates. Um, <laughs> so securing the edge, turning on the firewall. Um, this is an example, a slight change on a diagram some of you will have seen before. And it's a very, very sort of finger in the airway to just try and demonstrate that actually the edge is really fuzzy in OpenStack. And even if you did have a, a strongly defined edge in the more typical sort of network security viewpoint, um, 
the entire purpose of Nova is to take a foreign compute load and put it deep inside your infrastructure. So you have to do reasonably smart things to control it, and edge controls just aren't, aren't going to get you there. One of the reasons you have to rely on uh, more than just edge controls is uh, advanced exploitation. So something uh, some, some of you may have run into before is getting resistance to applying an update because it's going to slow things down or it, it's going to slow a release or, or something like that. Um, and the point here is that there are different ways that exploits can be combined. Um, they become what a, a purposeful attacker can do with a handful of exploits is, can be greater than the sum of its parts. So this is a great example. So uh, you have a web application running um, that's easily compromised. Uh, and that is then able to take over the Apache process without too much trouble. Now, your container here could be an actual container, or it could be a VM or something similar. But uh, you just need to wait for some sort of privilege escalation to allow you to gain control of that. And this is where we hear about these, these terms like advanced persistent threats. So a lot of the time in threat analysis, uh, people just focus on what can happen. And they have a very short timeline. Um, an attacker who really cares about subverting the organization that owns this could hang on to this point of presence in the container for months until they get something like a Linux privilege es escalation exploit that allows them to subvert the kernel and then subvert the entire machine. Now, of those of you that are involved in OpenStack closely will know today, in most configurations, when you own the machine, you have, priv you have access to all sorts of interesting credentials that will allow you to move around a lot of the infrastructure and subvert large parts of the cloud. So the ways to deal with this are to encourage defense in depth, um, to in in encourage people first off at the web application layer to use safe, uh, safe programming techniques and you know, secure their stuff. Um, but you can't and shouldn't rely on that. In all of our uh, threat analysis and in all of our uh, designs, um, at least at HP, we assume that all the VMs want to, want to hurt us. Right? We assume that everything is completely hostile. And it's great if it's not, but we assume that it is. There are some measures you can do at the virtualization layer to contain things. Uh, reducing the attack surface right throughout the stack is really important. So on your individual nodes, um, there's not really much point in running an entire li enterprise Linux stack when you could just be running exactly what you need to deliver that service. Uh, and that's um, something that we see a lot at the moment. And hardening kernels in, in, your, uh, in your image libraries is important as well. So there's a lot of hardening stuff I'm going to discuss in a few minutes um, that you should be able to apply to your image libraries that you're providing to your customers. And by doing that, you make things much easier down at the web application layer and uh, s saves you a lot of bother. So I said I'd talk to you a little bit about, about Venom and about breakouts. But of course, I already did. So uh, those of you that were in Hong Kong, um, we had a, a, a talk there about uh, hypervisor breakouts, the elephant in the room. Um, we hadn't had a hypervisor breakout for a few years then, and I predicted we would have a QMU-oriented breakout within the next 12 months, and just about on time we had one, um, which, which is a, a concern. So um, what are hypervisor breakouts or, or virtual machine escapes? Uh, they are where a, a virtual machine, through some level of inappropriate access to the services provided to it, is able to uh, gain a point of presence in the machine that it is running on. These are not new. Uh, VMware Cloudburst was widely reported to enable you to subvert ESX back in 2008. Um, Zen, uh, Zen Onage Trilogy in 2011, Virtunoid. It, it's been fairly consistent for the last few years. And of course, most recently, uh, Venom. So the point here is that breakouts aren't unicorns. They happen, they, they're actually fairly regular in the wild. Um, I've heard discussions that there are more, uh, more hypervisor breakouts around on the black market. Um, my personal opinion is we're unlikely to see many genuine zero days uh, just because they are very, very valuable. And by valuable, I mean expensive on the black market. 
So we still expect to see these vulnerabilities for the most part um, only really in the hands of those one or two top tier actors. However, occasionally things like Venom happen and occasionally people don't follow responsible disclosure too well. And occasionally everybody's days get ruined the week before a conference. So <laughs> developers are using virtual machines for all sorts of technology. Um, we see machines getting compromised all the time. And the reason for that is they use it for dev tests. We've taught developers that you have this throwaway resource. You no longer have to wait weeks for your IT department to provision you that server that you needed. And because they're easily available, they, developers are often uh, not as diligent about protecting them and, and looking after them as they should be. Because as far as they're concerned, if it gets compromised, oh, I'll just kill it off and create another one. So that creates a real challenge. And that's really an educational challenge for organizations running clouds. And for those of you running public clouds, uh, you, you're just stuck with it. Um, virtualization provides access to a lot of devices that are on by default. So again, when we were talking about this a couple of summits ago, um, I was describing the things like Bluetooth stacks that if most of you look at how you have your virtualization stack, configured today, well, you probably have Bluetooth compiled in. And you probably don't use much Bluetooth in your data centers. So you, <laughs> you may want to turn it off before someone owns you. Um, hardware reservations are an interesting strategy. So uh, th this idea that tenants will pay you some premium to reserve all of the metal that they're running on, um, or at least book it out just for, their, for their themselves. So that's always interesting. Um, and isolation and containment is really what the next few slides are going to be about. So Venom, uh, this, this is the lovely graphic that, that the Venom guys did. And uh, here you can see a web server has already been compromised. They've already escalated privileges to the virtual machine. They're then able to leverage a vulnerability in a, a floppy disk controller to uh, gain a point of presence in the QMU process, which was probably, for most people, going to be running in uh, LibVirt. At least if you're KVM, it'll be LibVirt. Um, now, depending on how you have things set up, that could be as far as the, the exploit goes. It could just get contained by whatever your mandatory access control framework is, and that should be it. But actually, the, the empirical evidence over the last, last week and the, the panicked emails I've had from people in various organizations leads me to believe that maybe people aren't doing that as well as they should be. Now, the, uh, the reason the vulnerability doesn't stop there is because from that point, you can, so from the point of having a point of presence in the QMU or LibVirt process for a KVM uh, machine, um, you can access probably the other virtual machines that are, that are running on that, on that system and the various things that they, the various resources they have available to them. But you could also escalate privileges to subvert that entire node. And when you do that, like we said earlier, you gain access to all the uh, configuration information and privileges that are on that box. So I'm going to talk to you about containment. And I'm, I'm going to have to start speaking a little bit faster as well. So I apologize for that. So containment is all about limiting the scope of a, of a VM breakout. We know VM breakouts happen. There's no point pretending they don't. So how do we contain them? So one way to do that, and I would say if you're going to invest time anywhere, invest it here, is in mandatory access controls. That is the SE Linux logo. That is not the AppArmor logo. As far as I can tell, there isn't one, but that, that guy's really cool. So they give you a few uh, capabilities. So you can define how a process should behave. You can block an alert when a, a process steps outside of that behavior. And things you can do there, you, know, you can define how a process should access files. If you have a process that, um, never reads anything from slash opt, for example, and then it starts reading. You can control that. Um, and it also gives you access to control uh, Linux capabilities as well. And primarily, there are two. And yes, I know there are things like SMAC, and I know GR Security does mandatory access controls as well. But realistically, most people are going to probably be looking at these two. Um, SE Linux gives you object, uh, object label based uh, security. It's very prescriptive controls, and it's highly complex. I think that's probably fair to say. You can't sit down and look at a, an SE Linux policy and understand it without having first read how SE Linux policies work. Um, it does give you some excellent control. Um, AppArmor is path-based. Uh, it's much easier to deploy. And there's, I, I think it's probably fair to say, better automated tooling around it today. Um, 
Some people will say that it doesn't give you the same granularity of control around what, what processes can do. Um, and there may be a trade-off to make in your organization. But just to illustrate, on the left we have an FTT, FTPD uh, app armor profile. And on the right we have the start of an SE Linux one. Now the one on the left I can probably read. I can understand that it's allowed to read from urandom, for example. Uh, the one on the right I, I struggle to read. Unfortunately, I also struggle to fit it on one slide, or two, or three, or four. So my point here isn't necessarily that one is better or worse than the other, um, but sometimes a less perfect system that everybody can deploy is better than a perfect system that nobody can, which does kind of sound like I'm trying to sell app armor, and I'm not, because my, friend, my Red Hat friends will beat me. So um, are we secure yet? We have mandatory access controls. Um, this came up in the ops security uh, discussion yesterday. Uh, how many people, well, I have a lot of operators here. OK, um, I'm going to assume that you all have some control in place, because I don't want you to have to admit that you don't. Who decided, despite the fact that they have great security, that they would be best off restarting their, their, um, their QMU stuff and, and clearing it out with a new version? in the light of Venom. Come on, be honest. I know it's more than that, because I saw some of you in the ops room. Awesome. So yeah, and that's perfectly reasonable. And even if I had all these awesome controls, um, one, of this one of the security controls we always push for is the ability to do um, rolling updates anyway. These controls don't fix things like Venom. They just buy you time to react without breaking your business. POSIX capabilities are interesting. So POSIX capabilities give you ways to grant processes specific privileges. Who here thinks that in order to deploy OpenStack effectively, you have to massively overuse things like sudo? Yeah, so my friend in the NSA gets it. Um, he's out, it's fine. Uh, so um, the use of privileges within OpenStack is at the moment uh, less advanced than it needs to be. Um, again, previously, this would have been hard to do. So uh, POSIX capabilities al allow an administrator on the command line to say, this service can do the following things as a privileged user without having to give them full privileged access to everything. Uh, a trivial example is if you were to um, use some basic uh, a web server, let's say. Um, the number of times we've seen something like Apache being run as root is, is fairly terrifying. And yes, I know there are drop privilege things and stuff, but go back a few years and they weren't there. Um, POSIX capabilities allow you to say, this process can bind to a privileged port, but it can't do anything else as a privileged user. And there's a couple of good ones I pulled out here. So binding to services, performing some system ad admin tasks is interesting. Uh, ptrace, so some debugging, and um, in fact, some security tools can do some interesting things by doing ptrace snooping but you don't necessarily want to give them full privilege to everything. So understanding where you do need privileges and granting them appropriately through POSIX capabilities is a great way of reducing the abilities of an attacker who has gained, gained some level of access to your system. Uh, set comp. So is everyone, is this everyone aware of set comp? No? Great, OK. Um, so set comp is a system that allows a, a running process to drop uh, access to most system calls. So the idea is that you can run in a secure mode. So in, in its first iteration, which uh, came out quite a while ago, I think it was about five, six years ago, 2.6, um, meant once a process was started running, so when you run QMU for the first time, it has to do a whole bunch of things. It has to read files. It has to set itself up. Um, once it's done, all its file descriptors are probably open. It's probably made all, actually, all the major system calls it needs to. And it could drop into what they call secure mode, which is now referred to more as, as mode one. And by doing that, it could then only have access to these uh, four, four syscalls with already open IDs. Uh, mode two is more interesting. Uh, it took a lot longer to develop. And you can use uh, Berkeley packet filter-like descriptions to say, um, to set a stage. So your process runs, it does all of its setup. And if it needs more than those four syscalls, before you were kind of stuck, it would have to carry on running with access to everything. Whereas now you can say, well, I need these four and five more, and I need to use them in this way, and then switch mode. Now, the interesting thing about set comp is once you've switched mode, you can't switch back. 
So that process from then on can't make any privileged disk calls. It can't make any calls to anything else. And this is where you're going to find interesting, potentially privesque opportunities. Um, so this process can no longer escalate privileges by abusing uh, syscalls that are found to be vulnerable because it, it can't call them. Um, GRSec including PAX. Uh, so firstly, I think the PAX logo is awesome. And that is their actual logo. I, I, that's all I do for talks is just Google Images. It's great. Um, it's, a, it's a whole bunch of kernel security enhancements um, that do, a, do a, a lot of interesting things. Uh, so one of the major things is enforces a strong least privilege policy system. GR security has its own mandatory access control framework. I don't know it well enough to comment on it on this talk, apart from to say, hey, it's there. And if you don't like App Armor or SE Linux or Smack, then there's GR security as well. Um, prevents uh, arbitrary code execution in the kernel and randomizes the layout of um, sensitive kernel structures. Again, this is to make uh, achieving a Linux privilege escalation much harder. It also uh, enforces a better mode of um, a better mode of blocking. Uh, I forget the forget the term now, but basically leveraging the NX bit so that uh, buffer overflows uh, can't can't so that CPU won't execute instructions unless they're actually marked appropriately to to be executed, um, and it will emulate that if your hardware doesn't support it. Um, and also memory read write controls. So this was really interesting. Um, in this model, uh, your memory can only ever be writable or readable at any one point, and it's very clear about those crossover points. So a, a, a compromised service that attempts to uh, read when it should be writing will, will get blocked, and all, all sorts of alarm bells will start ringing. Um, so the idea here is to stop privilege escalations, both in applications and at the kernel level. An interesting technology you can use here, and this is leveraged in containers a lot, is Linux namespace isolation. So isolation allows you to uh, have a process run in a certain way. Um, in fact, this combined with uh, C groups and a few other things is basically the foundation of what LXC provides for you to actually run containers, which is the foundational technology behind Docker. And yeah, insert your other container technology here. Um, but you can also leverage this uh, in the user land. In fact, um, does anyone know where this is used in OpenStack today? So Neutron uses uh, namespaces for providing full network stacks. That's really interesting. So um, the network isolation, the network namespace allows you to provide a process with a um, virtual interface uh, and it basically has a full stack there, including IP tables. So you can start coupling firewall rules and IP tables to individual services rather than to individual nodes. So you no longer have to have sort of, I, I've seen installations where you have one, basically one firewall rule that has every possible service for every possible node and just pushed out everywhere because it's the best way to not break things. And this way, um, you can bring these things much closer to your, to your running services. And like I said before, um, if you approach deploying OpenStack in a way that gives you multiple interpreters running in different places, uh, then you can start attaching their own stacks to them. You can start, so your Nova one will only have certain IP ad addresses allowable, perhaps. Um, you can really get quite granular and do some clever things. Uh, there are a whole bunch of namespaces. This isn't exhaustive. Um, some are more mature than others. Uh, so the user namespace uh, is interesting um, in that uh, it provides mappings from container processes so that even if someone were to gain a point of presence in a container where they would expect to be running with an effective UID of zero, they're actually not um, in terms of the system overall. Uh, so namespaces are a very interesting way of providing different types of isolation and um, extending security for, for different processes that are running. Uh, I mentioned control groups a second ago. So uh, C groups are how you uh, isolate and account for resource usage in, from different processes. Uh, amongst other things, it's how you make sure that um, you deal with noisy neighbors in KVM. Uh, so it's just a very good way of keeping track of what processes are doing. Um, lots of people run multiple OpenStack services on the same node, and this is a good way of ensuring that one vulnerable one, even if it's just caused to, to you know, loop infinitely, 
can't take down your, your entire cloud, right? So a quick review uh, of, of containment here. Um, so we've gone through AppArmor and S, uh, SVirt, which is the, the combination of, of policies that are provided for SE Linux. So I should have mentioned that before. Although the policies are kind of hard, SVirt exists already, which is pretty good for working with KVM. And I think uh, some Zen stuff as well. Um, set comp, very interesting for blocking access to incorrect tools, C groups, namespaces, GRSEC. There's also a bunch of uh, very good content on this in the security guide. Um, and there's some chapter references there for you. And obviously, I'll make these slides available. So I'm going to have to very quickly walk you through cloud configuration. And I'll just have to cut all the jokes out. So TLS everywhere. It's really hard. It can be quite messy. Um, we're working on ways to solve that. One of those ways is the Anchor project. Um, it's a passive revocation system that means that uh, provisioning certificates becomes a lot safer. And you can say cryptographically and with certainty, you know all the certificates in use within your organization for a certain time. And I skip over the other cool stuff. The other thing is uh, it gives you protection against some crypto attacks because we replace private keys every time we get new certificates, which means that things like Heartbleed wouldn't, have, wouldn't cause you any problems if you're using a system like Anchor. Data at rest, there are two opportunities available to you right now. One is hardware, um, so I'll wave the HP flag. If you want to deploy everything, data at rest with uh, no impact on performance, there's a product called HP Secure Encryption that has a negligible effect on um, read and write time. And you can deploy that all together nicely. Um, other opportunities for encryption exist, like LUKS. Um, problem with that becomes managing keys at scale. Where do you store the keys, and how do you make sure they get to nodes when nodes do things like spontaneously reboot? There are two ways that I think you can do that nicely. The first one too is, is, is to inject keys through your lights out management system. Uh, the second one, which is something I haven't discussed with anyone yet, is I want to work on having a bootstrap RAN disk that leverages PYKMIP to talk to a KMIP server and pull a key back to unlock the disks on that machine and then boot the machine. Uh, native level encryption is coming in Cinder, Nova Ephemeral, Swift, and Glance. After this talk today, there are both Swift and Glance design sessions. If you're interested in where that's going and you feel you can contribute to the design session, please go along. Entropy issues, um, you have to be clever about how you're handling crypto in terms of uh, virtual machines. Short version, Intel have an unprivileged instruction you can make from a virtual machine or go down through the, the vert, vert stack and pull back um, random for you. If you don't trust it, RD Rand, then watch Matthew Garrett's talk from a couple of days ago where he speaks a whole bunch more about how to do this and combine it with TPM. So OpenStack access controls, uh, you have policy.json files. Go and look at them. They probably need to be fixed for your deployment. Um, I think there's some advice on this in the security guide. There's also a great talk, talk from Adam Young a couple of days ago on the future of where this is going called dynamic access control. A note on OpenStack, security, uh, OpenStack tokens. Um, although you can get a scoped token, in terms of your threat analysis, and how you use a system, be aware that they can be rescoped. Um, this is a design feature. It's not a bug. It is confusing. You do see people expecting a Nova token to only be used for Nova actions. Um, go and have a look at OSSN 42, which goes into some depth on this. And Nathan Kinder has an excellent blog article on it as well. Intrusion detection. Uh, Dan Lambert spoke about this a couple of days ago. Uh, there are different ways and different places you can deploy IPS today. My personal favorite is to span off a secondary OVS on a compute node. There are other ways of doing it. Um, tapping off the bridge inter interface is one. Um, it would be nice to see some real progress on this. As far as I'm aware, Firewall as a service hasn't really become a thing. So everybody's doing their own thing. I'm very interested in setting up some reference architectures because I think everyone's actually interested in, in solving this problem. Host IDS. Uh, other IDS exist. OSSEC will give you all these nice properties and allow you to protect your system and detect when people are doing bad things. Um, other IDS exist. Credentials and shared access. So I should have mentioned this earlier. We're about to run out of time. Don't use the default passwords. You can do clever. <laughs> Please. 
Um, and if you want to get extra points, use Chef or Puppet so that you're pushing out different credentials to different nodes and updating things like the Nova database so you can all talk to them independently. Um, something funny about how security is really expensive and I should get paid more. Um, breakouts, not unicorns. Do smart things to protect against them. Defense in depth, they only buy you time. And open stack hardening, don't use the same passwords that come with your distribution. There you go.